Welcome to The Checkup. I'm Modern Healthcare Senior Reporter Alex Kasich, and I wanted to talk about a growing focus ensuring that everyone has equal access to healthcare services, no matter where you live or work. And those efforts often hinge on getting a diverse range of students interested in the medical field. And Hackensack Meridian Health has been adjusting its curriculum at its School of Medicine to attract more types of physicians and focus on social determinants of health rather than just clinical interventions. CEO of Hackensack Meridian Health, Bob Garrett, is joining me today to talk about those initiatives. Thanks for joining me, Bob. Thanks for having me, Alex. So I wanted to start with uh, how staffing issues uh, are affecting Hackensack Meridian Health. Yeah, so uh, we are impacted uh, by the uh, current staffing uh, crisis like uh, most health systems around the country. Certainly COVID exacerbated that. I think there were um, some shortages in, um, in key areas like uh, nursing, um, some of the support functions, patient care technicians. And through these uh, various waves of COVID, um, that certainly exacerbated the situation. And you know, at the peak of the uh, Omicron um, variant, uh, which was in uh, January, we had to employ upwards of 1,200 um, agency-based uh, nurses to uh, supplement the um, existing staff. Having said all that, uh, you know, it's calmed down quite a bit. We've seen um, nurses returning to uh, work who might have been out sick with COVID, but also um, those that um, have uh, let their uh, contract expire with uh, with agency nurses. There is still still a fundamental shortage, and we're trying to be creative to uh, to address it, like um, really doubling down on our partnerships with uh, with schools and universities to be sure that we have ample supply of uh, our personnel going uh, going forward. But um, certainly not as bad as it was maybe a few months back, but um, definitely um, a problem that I think will be with us for some time. So I'm wondering how you're addressing this on the front end as you try to get, you know, more people interested in the medical field and then ensure there's a diverse pool of people, you know, applying and, and trying to get into uh, medical school. I'm just uh, wanted to learn more about the curriculum uh, that you've implemented at the Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine and how that seems to have a broader focus outside of what's the traditional scope of of, of medicine and treatment? So we, we created the Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine uh, about four or five years ago uh, based on uh, what we saw was uh, going to be a significant physician shortage. The idea of the school was to um, retain talent within uh, New Jersey and recruit talent from, uh, from beyond uh, New Jersey into, into our state. Um, we saw, again, we saw COVID really um, exacerbate that, um, that issue. So one of the um, core um, curriculum items for the school is what we call the um, Human Dimension uh, Program. And um, it's, um, it's based on community um, immersion. So what medical students literally do is they uh, pair up with um, individuals and families, um, mostly from underserved communities, and they follow those families um, for their three or four years of medical education. Now, um, some other medical schools might have an elective class that's dedicated to, uh, to that type of um, uh, approach, but um, in our case, uh, we require it uh, not just for a class, not just for a semester, but for their entire medical education. And the way it works, Alex, is that um, those students then will follow uh, two families during the course of their, um, their tenure as, uh, as students. They will learn firsthand some of the challenges that those, um, those families are having, particularly in underserved communities, based on uh, some of the social determinants of health, such as um, insecure finances or um, housing um, security, food insecurities, uh, transportation barriers, even mental illness and um, addiction. Those are issues that are keeping these individuals and families from um, accessing healthcare and staying, um, staying healthy, maybe uh, preventing them from even going to a physician's office on a regular uh, basis. So we believe it's a, a core piece of um, providing equal access to care to teach medical students early on um, some of the, about some of these issues and to really focus on prevention as much as uh, treatment. We think it's really going to be important. And we'll make this 
this new generation of physicians that much more effective and able to really uh, face some of the realities that, um, that the medical community is, is uh, dealing with. How does this differ from traditional approaches to medical school curricula? Um, you know, it's, it's so much harder to grapple some of these uh, issues that typically have been outside the scope of healthcare providers, where you're looking at issues like housing um, and, you know, what the makeup of their neighborhood is, what type of connections they have to education and nature and nutrition. So how do you go about uh, addressing these issues? I imagine, you know, some partnerships are involved, but it sounds like it's a re redefining, a rehoning of, of how you're trying to train and address some of these systemic issues. Yeah, I, I look at it as a transformation of, uh, of medical education. So traditional medical education really focused on um, clinical uh, learning skills, and, and our school does that as well. But um, we have found, uh, you know, through our own research and studies that these social determinants, these barriers that exist, really play a big part in, um, in, in one's health. So um, through, uh, and you're absolutely right, through partnerships, through community uh, partnerships, we're able to identify um, people who are at high risk for one or more of these social determinants and then make referrals to, uh, to various um, community centers. Although the medical students, they're not doctors yet, so they, they can't practice medicine, but they can certainly make these types of referrals and help these individuals and families. And of course, they're under the supervision of, uh, of faculty who, who are trained physicians and um, who can consult on these um, issues as, uh, as well. So, you know, just a couple examples, uh, you know, they're, they're, in, they're in communities, um, they're able to um, really um, uh, hook up, as an example, um, people who have diabetes uh, with um, nutrition specialists. And in one case, there was one, um, one family uh, where um, an individual lost uh, 14 pounds in a really short period of time, needs less uh, diabetic med medication. They've helped people quit smoking. They've, uh, they found better and uh, more affordable um, housing for, uh, for people who uh, really um, did not have secure housing. And during the pandemic, uh, which was really a, a very nice uh, thing, they were able to, to teach seniors um, in these communities how to use their um, iPads so they could engage in telehealth and really connect with their, uh, with their providers. So I thought just those, those types of examples um, probably you, would, you wouldn't have seen that in a traditional medical school uh, curriculum. And uh, we're really proud of it. Um, it's received some national attention, national recognition. The American Hospital Association um, was uh, bestowed upon our medical school for this, this type of a program, their, um, their AHA um, NOVA Award uh, for innovation. And we think it's gonna be the wave of the future. As I said, other medical schools are starting to adapt it, but not to the scale uh, where, where Hackensack Meridian has. And how are you gauging the success of these programs? I imagine you're looking at enrollments, uh, the type of students that are enrolling, and also you know feedback from students in terms of how uh, the the curriculum's designed to ensure that you know it's it's achieving the goals that are set out. So I'm wondering how you're overall kind of measuring success here. Yeah, great question. You know, um, we there's there's two uh, two ways that I think you know just kind of jump out in terms of uh, measuring success. One is that we uh, we have to do as part of the accreditation process, we have to do a um, a student survey, and uh, they talk about what's working in their medical education, maybe what's not working, and by you know by big numbers, this program stands out as one that um, is really working where they find it's valuable, where they're learning about um, these social determinants, learning about the inequities in healthcare um, access and in healthcare outcomes. It, it comes out loud and clear, kind of screams out from the uh, survey. The other piece is in the admissions process, um, when we talk to our admissions committee, this, um, this program, this human dimension program, the community immersion program that I've been speaking about, is um, by far the uh, biggest differentiator uh, for our medical school as to why students want to come to the Hackensack Meridian um, School of Medicine. I mean, after all, we're a, we're a new school. We're the first private medical school in, um, in 60 years, and students are taking a chance on a, on a new school um, as we're going through uh, the accreditation process. And one of the reasons it's been widely successful is because of this program. 
I mean, just to, as an example, this uh, this last uh, couple of months, we um, we had uh, close to six thousand um, applicants for a, a new class of about um, one hundred sixty five um, students. So um, that's you know just an example of uh, of how popular our school is right now. I'm just wondering too, in terms of how you think the pandemic has shaped the workforce. I understand you know enrollment has ticked up at your school of medicine, but you would think that how difficult it's been for healthcare providers over the past two plus years now. How does that affect interest in trying to join the medical field? And, you know, you've seen those that are in the medical field leave at higher rates or transition or retire. Um, And I'm just wondering, just in terms of the overall pipeline, how you think that's been shaped uh, by, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I think it's kind of um, two different um, impacts. One at the, um, the the more senior end, if you will, for for um, physicians and other healthcare prof- professionals who have been in the field for a long time. I, I think it hastened some retirements. We saw quite a bit of uh, burnout, um, and you know we've had to institute many wellness programs for our, our team members as a result of what they've been through. Uh, being on the front lines now for over two years since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. On the front end, though, it's interesting because um, we're seeing, you know, great interest in uh, medical schools and even in some of the nursing schools that we're affiliated with. Um, You know, there and and we hear from students uh, who are really energized by the fact that uh, they'll be able to participate, as an example, in um, in vaccinating, um, vaccinating the general public. So we've had a, you know, we've deployed some of our medical students during the, the pandemic to uh, help um, at our vaccination centers in, in vaccinating um, um, individuals. And uh, that's that's something that has actually motivated them. And they feel like, wow, you know, we're 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 living through a pandemic. We're learning a lot. We're participating, whether it's through teaching seniors how to how to use telehealth or uh, vaccinating, um, you know, all age groups at a, at a, a mega vaccination center. It seems to be uh, motivating a lot of younger people to, uh, mm-hmm. to 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 come into the field. So it's kind of I think the two forces are kind of uh, you know kind of counteracting each other a little bit. We're seeing a lot of uh, burnout at the at the more senior end, but um, you know on an encouraging note, you know uh, if if those numbers continue, I think uh, hopefully you know the workforce of the future will look a little bit brighter than it does today. What other initiatives are underway at Hackensack Meridian to uh, try to combat, you know, this health equity issue as well as broaden your your the scope of of your interventions to, you know, social determinants. Uh, you know, what what else comes to mind? So, you know, we we yeah, I, I always say that there's a um, a moral and um, and a strategic imperative to uh, address health equities from the perspective of um, access to care and also from the perspective of um, of uh, disparities in outcomes. So uh, we have uh, we have made um, healthcare equity, health equity, a major strategic priority at Hackensack uh, Meridian Health. We have seven major strategic priorities. This is uh, right at the uh, the top of the list. So from our board all the way through our uh, workforce, we we really educate and we are focused on on um, achieving health equity and reducing some of these inequities that are out there. You know, one example, um, and you know. The statistics, of course, Alex, are out there. I mean, it, you know, from a from a moral perspective, I mean, when you you hear um, such disturbing statistics as um, as an example of um, African American women dying at four times the rate of their white counterparts, uh, the COVID experience, right? Um, uh, people of color were twice as likely to uh, to get COVID, or three times as likely to get COVID, and twice as likely, sadly, to uh, to die from it. Um, life expectancy um, is, you know, is is a big disparity now. I think it's 3.5 years between uh, the white population and uh, and people of color. So, um, you know, one of the programs that we're we're really proud of that we think is uh, is is making a um, a difference is uh, we have um, a screening um, tool. It's a digital platform called uh, NowPow. And um, in a really short period of time, uh, we have um, we have screened now 300,000 um, people who have come into contact with our health network. Uh, they, they could be inpatients, they could be outpatients. And of those 300,000 people who are screened, 
to be at high risk for one of those social determinants of health, we have now assisted 70,000 of them by making referrals to, to their communities. You know, similar to what we're doing at the medical school, we're doing on a, on a mass scale at Hackensack uh, Meridian. We've also partnered with uh, New Jersey's largest um, insurance company, health insurance company, Horizon Blue, Cr Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And like most insurance companies, they have an incredibly rich database in terms of patient information. So they've been able to help us identify people who are at high risk uh, based on their zip code, based on where they, uh, where they live. And we've been able to uh, refer um, 8,000 uh, of those people for, uh, for help as well through uh, this program. It's called Horizons uh, Neighbors in Health. And you know, just to full disclosure, they've partnered with Hackensack Meridian, but they've also partnered with other health systems in the state of New Jersey. So it's just a couple of examples of, I, I, I believe, where you know, we are getting at both um, access uh, in terms of equity and also Try, trying to change the narrative in terms of um, outcomes as well. And I think it's going to be through partnerships, whether it's through this NowPow um, digital platform partnership or through partnerships with insurance companies like Horizon, Blue Cross, and Blue Shield. I don't think you know any health system, um, and Hackensack Meridian included, can do it on their own. They really need to, uh, to, to seek these um, very important partners. So again, there's a strategic um, and moral imperative to uh, to really address healthcare inequity inequities. And yeah, you know, one of the things you, we've noticed over the past two years are these collaborations sparking between uh, across what once were competing hospitals in the same market or health systems in the same market, and then insurers too are coming to the table, uh, you know, in trying to form strategic partnerships to combat some of these issues that were exacerbated during the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the questions I wonder as a report on this is how long will those last, you know, beyond the public health emergency, as you've seen this renewed interest and urgency to form, you know, these collaborative relationships and whether those will persist or things will revert back to the business as usual. Well, I, I hope they do persist. Um, I think they, uh, they will. I think uh, through these partnerships, uh, we've been able to achieve some great outcomes, but we're going to need the help of government. And that's, you know, the, the kind of the third leg of the stool. When you're talking about providers and insurers, you're going to need government in terms of healthcare policy and Medicare uh, policy uh, to, uh, to really incentivize both insurers and providers to continue in these, uh, these partnerships so they, they can be uh, sustained. Now, another thing I, I, I think is worth mentioning is also uh, the fact that we want to make sure that our workforce really reflects the communities that we serve. Because again, there's been a lot in the literature about the um, impact um, and how people um, in, in various um, ethnic communities really relate to, uh, to people that might look like them or, or speak the same language or whatever the case may be, um, their outcomes are uh, better, they're more likely to see that provider. So we want to, it's really important from our perspective to make sure that our workforce really reflects uh, the communities that we serve. And I think we've, we've, we've done a good job there. I think we still have some opportunities, particularly at the leadership level and at the board level, but we're really uh, making some concerted efforts to, uh, to uh, really address that. And then, you know, the other piece I would say is, um, there's definitely, um, and this, this has caused inequities in, in both access and outcomes, there's definitely uh, been, um, I would say, um, implicit bias that's been, been out there for, uh, for a long time uh, in terms of how um, particularly people of color are, are treated by uh, healthcare professionals, which goes back probably you know, hundreds of years. And so we are um, undertaking a massive program to uh, train our workforce on implicit uh, bias. They're all going through that educational process now. We're over 10% complete with our workforce. By this time next year, we hope to be at 100% and all new team members going through orientation will have this as well. But to me, that's not good enough. We have to make sure our leaders go through that, uh, that training and our board. So we have started that process as, uh, as well. Well, Bob, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today and uh, telling us more about some of the programs at Hackentech. Well, thanks again for covering this, Alex. All right. Thank you all for watching and uh, tune in for the next checkup.